For centuries, humans have been growing alongside our botanical brethren. Our histories have mixed and mingled to bring us modern medical marvels, faded folklore, and everything in between. Of course, in order to understand the plant, we have to start with its roots. I'm M. Grebner Gaddis, and this is Rooted. Hello, and welcome back to another week of Rooted. For part three of our Planty Potion series, we'll actually be taking a closer look at two different ingredients today, toe of frog and wool of bat. Toe of frog, more commonly known as bulbous buttercup, is a species of wildflower native to Western Europe throughout the northern Mediterranean, but was also introduced to the colder and wetter areas of North America, where it now grows in hayfields, along roads, and in large patches in fields and prairies. Its botanical name is Ranoculus bibulbus, which really sounds like a Harry Potter spell to make someone blow up like a frog balloon in Shrek. But anyway, these guys are called the bulbous buttercup not because of their flowers, which are the same four-leaved, tiny, cup-shaped flowers we all expect for buttercups, but because of their bulbous, corm-like roots. If you remember from last week's episode, corms are a kind of root that allow perennials to spread and grow. And in the case of bulbous buttercup, these corms look like teeny tiny turnips, but also kind of like the sticky icky fingers of frogs and toads if you ask certain witches. Their tiny turnip bottoms have also earned them the nickname St. Anthony's Turnips because, according to history, St. Anthony, the patron saint of lost things, was actually a pig herder, and pigs notoriously love to munch on them while they're moving from place to place. Pigs aren't the only ones feeling the love for these fat-bottomed botanicals, though. Pollinators also love rubbing their little butts all over their tiny yellow blooms. This is mostly because for each bulbous buttercup plant, there can be hundreds of tiny blooms, all packed with pollen and waiting for those tiny little rumps to rummage around in them, spreading all of that pollen-y goodness to the next flower, and repeating the cycle over and over again. They're also very bright, making them easy to spot as a snack for said bees and pals. While pigs and pollinators are shouting the praises of bulbous buttercup from the rooftops, I wouldn't be so quick to jump on the bandwagon, mostly because bulbous buttercup is poisonous to most of us. This is due to the glycoside ranoculin that it and the rest of the buttercup family contains. Ranoculin is contained in all parts of the plant and is released when it's chewed or eaten, where it metabolizes as glucose and the toxin protoammonium, which causes a painful rash, jaundice, and even acute hepatitis if ingested, or contact dermatitis if brushed against. It can also cause digestive issues in livestock, besides pigs, and people, meaning you absolutely should not kiss their heads if you see them, as they've developed this poison as a defense mechanism to keep us all from touching them. However, once the root is dried, the poison oxidizes, making it no longer harmful, but still not a super tasty treat. However, an extra fun fact is that cows do sometimes eat these when they get dried out with their hay, where it can act as a bit of a stimulant, kind of like your morning cup of coffee. Back in the day, bulbous buttercup was used to symbolize new beginnings, as its brilliant little blooms pop up in early spring and are some of the first pops of color to fill the countryside, serving as a sign of enduring life and the hope we find in new beginnings. I couldn't really find a ton about how this would be used in a potion. In the play, the witches are trying to create a potion that would just ultimately lead to like the ultimate evil, so I'm kind of just assuming they put this in there partially for the vibes, but mostly for the poison. However, in other forms of spiritualism and potion making, I could also see an argument for using it to kind of manifest a brighter, happier, or more prosperous future. But like I said, I really couldn't find a ton of use cases here. However, what I could find more information on was the way these guys were used in traditional herbalism and healing. 
it turns out they were super useful for treating warts, gout, and rheumatism. And before we dive deeper into all those amazing uses and how they work, I just want to take a second to drop some newly acquired knowledge on you. Gout, the disease I think most of us assume only rich white old dudes like Kings and Benjamin Franklin could get, is in fact still alive and impacting more people than you might realize. If you went to public school or went through a long and slightly troubling Shakespeare slash Poe phase, there's a great chance that when you pictured gout, it conjures up images of grossly inflamed and engorged men who drank to excess and ate exclusively red meat and or those massive turkey legs they still give you at medieval times. And like me, you might have wrongly assumed that it was kind of like scurvy. But gout is actually a blood disease where your blood decides to turn against you and like something out of a sci-fi movie, turns into sharp little crystals that stab you from the inside. Awful, I know. And it turns out that while overconsumption of meat or alcohol can cause it, the main determining factor is actually genetics. So even if you aren't living life like a Viking king or founding father, you might still get the same painful disease as them. Okay, back to what you came here for. Planty cures for ancient and modern ailments. Bulbous buttercup was effective at treating warts, gout, and rheumatism due to the very same reaction I mentioned earlier. The stems or roots were cut, then applied directly to inflamed joints, causing painful blisters, but also increasing blood flow, helping to ideally reduce inflammation and encourage healing in those areas. Apparently, it was also sometimes used to treat shingles and sciatica, where a few drops would be mixed with wine and then either drunk or dropped directly onto the skin to fight against those ailments by increasing the flow of blood and other healing bodies. Today, I'm happy to report that we have found much safer and effective treatments for pretty much every ailment listed. So it's safe to say this guy doesn't need a spot in your medicine cabinet unless you're stranded in an area with literally no other options. But even then, I would take a second look to see if there was anything else that could work. While we aren't leaning on this plant to treat our problems, there is still plenty it can teach us about ourselves, most notably if we're in love. If you grew up with any kind of buttercup, you're probably familiar with this infamous test. The idea is that if you hold a bright yellow buttercup up against your chin and it reflects yellow, or leave some kind of pollen under your face, you're in love. Or you love butter, but I mean, who among us doesn't? And while buttercups have long been letting us know when someone is in love with butter or a person, they have even more established lore than that. While there are many different kinds of buttercup, they have their own entire family for goodness sake, there are only a few origin stories and bits of folklore I could find. In the Pacific Northwest region of the United States, it's told that there was once a playful coyote who loved playing fetch. So much that when he couldn't find anything else to throw, he would use his own eyes. He would throw them super high into the air, then run to catch them. Kind of like an early gory version of Ball and Cup, but before we had invented either of those things. One day, Eagle saw Coyote throwing his eyes into the air and decided to teach him a thing or two. After all, Coyote clearly couldn't understand the value of his eyes if he was so willing to just toss them around. So, Eagle swooped down and stole Coyote's eyes. Blinded, scared, and unable to find Eagle, Coyote searched for an alternative. That's when he stumbled upon the brilliant and reflective patch of buttercups which he quickly plucked off their stems and put into his eye sockets, thus explaining why even today, coyotes have such bright, reflective yellow eyes. Meanwhile in Europe, there was a greedy man who loved gold, and valued it more than anything else. He loved gold so much that he refused to spend it, even on things he needed. He ate only one egg, one carrot, 
one apple, and one piece of crust a day, just so he could avoid spending a single cent more than he had to. Even if it meant being miserable his whole life. No avocado toast or Starbucks for this guy. He took it so far that he even refused to get a haircut or buy scissors to cut his own hair, letting his long, crusty, dry-ass locks drag the ground, collecting dust, leaves, and tangles with every single step. Picture the split ends on that guy. After years of living the saddest life of all time, the man had so much gold that he was practically Scrooge McDuck. But instead of diving into his giant gold piles like a pool, he had all of his gold coins neatly stacked in his house, which he could barely squeeze into because it was so filled with gold. One day, our unkempt and unpleasant billionaire was walking home with yet another bag of gold to ogle at and hoard. When he stumbled upon some fairies who were in desperate pursuit for a roof of their new house, which they had literally just built. As luck would have it, the gold coins were the exact size and shape they needed. Thrilled to have found a solution, they quickly asked the man if they could have just one gold coin, and in exchange, they would use their magic to send all of his remaining gold home for him, saving him the trouble of a long and unpleasant walk through the countryside with a hefty bag of gold. Irritated and irate at the idea of sharing, this man swatted at the fairies and shouted at them to go away and work a little bit harder if they wanted gold. Frustrated by this man's unwillingness to even consider their offer and solution, the fairies decided the next best thing would be to turn this man's obnoxious hoard of gold into buttercups. That way, everyone could enjoy and share some of the wealth and they could still have a wonderful roof over their heads. So, with some quick thinking, they used a sharp blade of grass to cut a hole in his bag, letting all of his gold slowly fall to the ground. Then, they turned all of the gold coins into seeds, allowing the wind to carry them far and wide. Soon, the whole countryside was filled with brilliant buttercups, and the fairies had an even better roof than the coin would have been. And the man... Well, he made it home, wondering why the bag was so light, but not really managing to notice that any of his gold was missing. While bulbous buttercups have long been used to teach us lessons and tell us more about ourselves, today they're mostly seen as weeds and wildflowers, not really being cultivated or used in landscaping, medicine, food, or witchcraft. But that doesn't make them any less beautiful or important to the ecosystems they're native to, as they provide an excellent and vital source of food and protection to many other animals, plants, and other species in the regions they come from. While that's all I've got for Toe of Frog, it's certainly not the end of our witchy fun for the week. Next on the list is Wool of Bat, which is commonly believed to be moss. Now, there isn't any information I could dig up on the exact kind of moss they're talking about, so I'm using my best judgment and some of my botanical sleuthing skills, plus taking some creative liberties to come up with the answer for this one. When asking myself what moss was most likely to be a wolf bat, I knew it needed to be one, commonly found in Shakespearean England, and two, look woolly, but woolly in a way that it could potentially live on a bat. I know, I kind of had my work cut out for me, but luckily I was left with one clear winner in my heart, rough stocked feather moss. Before we dig into that guy, I wanted to take a second to briefly touch on a botanical obsession of mine, and that's the difference between moss and lichen, which are two completely different things, but very, very easy to mix up. Moss is a super early plant, but just that, a plant. It doesn't have roots, but it does have leaves and stems, and these teeny tiny hair-like structures called rhizoids, which help them to stick to rocks and trees, but don't actually absorb nutrients. Lichen, on the other hand, aren't technically plants. Even though they like the same conditions and often grow right next to moss, they really couldn't be more different. 
lichen are actually a commingling of fungus and algae or cyanobacteria, which makes them able to withstand a wider variety of climates, with algae being able to undergo photosynthesis to produce nutrients, and the fungus playing a vital role in protecting the algae so it doesn't dry out or die. The best way to tell these two apart is to look for teeny tiny stems and leaves. Moss will have them, but lichen won't. Now that we've gotten that tidbit out of the way, let's get back to bat wool. Now, the reason that I think wool of bat likely would have been rough stocked feather moss, or Brachycyllum rutabolum, is because it's easy to find, super woolly and soft looking, and would have been readily available to harvest for pretty much anyone in the area in that time frame. It's also known as ordinary moss, and it grows on pretty much any wet rock, rotting log, or soggy tree. In fact, this stuff is probably what you think of when you think of moss, especially if you live in the UK. It's described as forming medium-sized carpets of thick, light yellow to dark green patches that grow tiny egg-shaped capsules. Capsules that, according to the British Biological Society, look like tiny fairy lights. These tiny little eggs contain spores that the mosses will use to reproduce and are held up on teeny tiny pale stems. Moss has played a variety of roles in medicine throughout history, though most commonly it's best known for its use in wound dressing. While many of us tend to think of sphagnum moss as being the best variety for the job due to its absorption power, a recent study actually found that ordinary moss could be as much as 75% more absorbent due to the cushion-like shape of its leaves. Outside of being the world's best band-aid, rough-stocked feather moss was also a sort of early-day ointment for some people in the Himalayan region where they would mix it with milk and honey then apply that mixture to cuts, burns, and scrapes to help fight off infection. This worked mostly because the moss has antibacterial properties that have been shown to be effective against E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus, and many other nasty viruses. Moss was also used to symbolize wisdom and patience. Since it's the oldest of all plants, that makes sense, and it also takes its time to grow slowly and carefully. In spells, it's definitely more common to see Irish moss specifically called for, but I saw mention of moss in general being good for protection or amplifying intention in a spell. So, like we talked about earlier, knowing the witch's goal was to conjure up pure evil, I think I could see why they were going for as much protection as they possibly could get for themselves. But moss doesn't just protect people casting spells. It actually plays a vital role in protecting and supporting the ecosystems it's a part of. Because it's so absorbent, moss can actually help to prevent flooding and other damage that can come from increased rainfall, as it helps give that water a place to go before it can wash out the soil and other plants. It's also one of the first species to appear, laying the groundwork for other plants, insects, and eventually larger animals to come back and make that area a forest home of their own. In gardens, moss is often used as a ground cover in shady, wet areas and can add visual interest in a pop of green to pretty much anything. It's also said to have a calming effect on people, making it a super popular addition to many different kinds of zen gardens. While it may be called ordinary moss, I think we can all agree that rough-stocked feather moss is doing extraordinary things. I don't live in an area with much moss, but if you do, the next time you see a moss covered in what looks like adorable egg-shaped fairy lights, take a second to say hello and appreciate all this moss has done and continues to do. And conjure up an image of a bat wearing an adorable cable knit sweater made out of the stuff. I'm sure you'll be glad you did. That's all I've got for this week, but I'll be back before you know it with another episode digging into the life and times of potion ingredients in the Three Witches Cauldron. See you then! If you like the show, please consider subscribing and leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Rooted.Pod, we're on YouTube at Rooted.Podcast, 
And you can check out our website, rootedpod.com, for transcripts, updates, and so much more. Special thanks to Eric Cluxon for writing and performing our theme music, and of course, a special thank you to all of you for being here. Until next time, be kind to yourselves, be kind to the earth, and just like a plant, drink your water. <laughs>